I had an a opportunity to, to try to raise some money for the church at the auction last night. I decided to auction off my sermon topic for this morning. So I got my topic about 10 hours before the last service and, and slept a few hours last night, I think. But I'll tell you that when the bidding got to $5,000, I realized I'm going to have to take this kind of seriously. <laughs> So I'm working on about three hours sleep, so this ought to be interesting for everybody. This may be the first time that one of my sermons puts me to sleep, not just you all in the pews. (laughs) The auctioneer last night said that if, if it were up to him, if he got to choose the sermon, the topic that he wanted, remember what it was? It was, uh, is there tweaking in, twerking in heaven? Twerking (laughs) in heaven, yes. I heard a person sitting next to me said, I thought that was heaven. Some of you don't know what that means, but you can ask, ask me later. I'll... <laughs> the, uh, fortunately, the auctioneer was not eligible to bid on the item. So the topic was given to me by Mike Wessinger, our very generous winner last night. And the topic that he gave me, very thoughtful. I'm really, I, it wasn't something I could just wing. So I did have to stay up and actually work on it. It was, it ain't my fault. Very thoughtful, compelling topic, especially when you think of everything that's going on in Washington, D.C. right now, everybody pointing the finger, passing the buck, it's their fault, it's his fault, it's their fault. It seems like our politicians are trying to rewrite our national anthem so that it will say, America, the land of the free and the home of the blame. Our politicians seem to have what a nurse friend of mine calls Adam's syndrome. I don't know if you know about that. She, she told me this story of one time she was, went in to help a patient, and he just kept saying, she's like, why are you here? And he said, well, I'm here because of my wife. And she said, what do you mean because of your wife? He said, well, my wife, it's my wife, the food she gives me, the stress she gives me, the, you know, and he just went on about the way she treats, you know, she doesn't do this, she doesn't do that. And so she was just going on and on and on. And finally, this nurse said, well, it seems like you have Adam's syndrome. And, and at that point, his wife kind of peaked, perked up and said, do you know that just from taking his temperature and everything? And his vital signs? How do you know? And what's Adam's syndrome? And he leaned in and they, well, he wanted to know. And she said, well, are you guys, are you Christians? And they said, yeah, yeah, we're Christians. And she said, well, you remember? So Adam, remember, he says to God, he says, you, you know, it's that woman you made for me that, that got me to eat the, this fruit. And of course, then she says, oh, it was that serpent that got me to, you know, because serpents are so seductive, that got me to eat that that fruit. So we kind of, it's the Adam syndrome, it's passing the buck. It's not my fault. Um, Lao Tzu, the great Chinese philosopher, said a great nation is like a great person. When he makes a mistake, he realizes it. Having realized it, he admits it. Having admitted it, he corrects it. And he considers those who point out his faults as his most benevolent teachers. Let me tell you what's not my fault. Let's just start there. It's not my fault that I was born male. It's not my fault that my parents were American, middle class, and white. It's not my fault that there are poor people. It's not my fault that there was once slavery. It's not my fault that there was once a race riot in Tulsa that destroyed 39 square blocks, killed many people, and destroyed many homes and businesses. It's certainly not my fault that people get cancer. It's not my fault that gay and lesbian people are not welcome in so many Tulsa churches. The list of things that's not my fault is so big that I could pretty much justify anything. It's like the excuse that many employees make. They say, well, it's not my department. It's not my fault if your parents got divorced. It's not my fault if you're the child of an alcoholic. It's not my fault if you were abused as a child. And at the same time, it's not your fault if your parents got divorced. 
And it's not your fault if you're the child of an alcoholic. And it's not your fault if you were abused. A lot of things happen that are not our fault. In fact, our lives are filled with many blessings and challenges that have nothing to do with anything that we have done. The most important question is not really who's to blame, but it's how to respond. Why is it that one person who's the victim of abuse as a child uses it as an excuse? And another person uses it as motivation to help others. Last night at our auction, I had a chance to talk with one of our youth who were helping, our youth choir were helping with the auction last night, and one of our youth came up to me. She was really excited to talk to me and tell me about what she'd done earlier that day yesterday. She said she spoke at a conference to teachers and parents and other professionals, and she got to talk about her experience of being bullied. It turns out that she'd been bullied quite a bit. And she said it was incredible to watch. People, there were people crying. She's just a teenager. And she said there were, she said people came up and told me how much they admired my courage and my dignity. And I can tell by the look in her face and the glint in her eye and the confidence in her voice that she is going to be a great leader that's going to help a lot of people in her life. Because she is going to use her experience of pain and hardship to help many others. That's in part because she has two very supportive and wonderful parents, and she has a very supportive church and youth group. We all inherit our share of blessings and challenges, and the most important question is, what are we going to do with them? Because we can't change the past. Now, it's the same in politics. All politicians come into office and they inherit all the good and the bad of the previous administrations. Once in office, they can't just keep blaming the last administration. They have to take responsibility for what they're going to do. They've run for office. They've achieved the office. Now it's their turn. Now, I know I'm speaking to a lot of liberals this morning in all three of our services. As they say, it takes one to know one. I don't want to turn this into a political talk. That'd be easy to do with this topic. But I have to say that I find it fascinating that from the liberal political worldview right now, everything that went wrong in the last administration is President Bush's fault. And everything that's gone wrong since that administration is the Republicans' fault. In other words, the way it looks to most liberals, and I realize I'm generalizing here, but since 2000, pretty much everything that has gone wrong in politics in this country is due to the Republicans. Isn't that convenient? In other words, it's not our fault. Blame them. But mistakes and bad decisions and terrible policies and bad compromises have been made on both sides. And if people or parties or nations cannot see and admit their faults, then they're not going to learn. And they don't learn. Do you have any baseball fans here this morning? Any baseball fans? All right, we've got a few. So in baseball, the scorecard reads three things. Runs, hits, and errors. Right, see, nobody likes causing errors, but at least in baseball, they admit that and they acknowledge that everybody makes them. They put them right up there for everybody to see. But we live in a no-fault culture. We have no-fault divorce and no-fault insurance, and we're told by our lawyers not to ever admit fault, even in a car accident, even if we caused it. Don't say it's your fault. 
Politicians say things like, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. And famously, during a debate with John Kerry, President Bush, while running for his second term, was asked by Linda Grable. During the last four years, she said, you have made thousands of decisions that have affected millions of lives. Please give three instances in which you came to realize that you made a wrong decision and what you did to correct it. And he could not come up with or admit to even one. This was a president who, like him or not, was wrong in his claim that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. He was wrong in claiming that Saddam was linked to Al-Qaeda. He was wrong in predicting that the Iraqis would greet American soldiers with dancing in the streets. He was wrong in predicting that the conflict would be over quickly. He was wrong in grossly underestimating the financial cost of the war. And he was most incredibly wrong in his famous speech six weeks after the invasion began when under the banner, Mission Accomplished, he stated, major combat operations in Iraq have ended. Even conservative columnist George Will joined others like Paul Krugman in saying to President Bush, you need to admit that you were wrong. Now, when George Will and Paul Krugman agree on anything, <laughs> it's got to be pretty undeniable. You know, it's hard enough for anyone, any one of us, to admit when we're at fault, to admit when we're wrong. But when a mistake has cost thousands of lives and trillions of dollars, it's really hard. But the test of a person's character, just like the test of a nation's character, is once we've made an error, how do we respond? Can you see where this is going? I've given a bunch of examples of things that are not a person's fault. And the question in those instances is, even though it's not my fault, what is my responsibility? And I've given examples of situations where it is someone's fault. And the question remains, since I've made a mistake, what's my responsibility? In other words, assigning blame and finding fault has its role, has its purpose, but in the end, the question that we all need to wrestle with, all of us need to wrestle with is, with the blessings and the problems that I've inherited, what can I do? Now, I mentioned the Tulsa race riot earlier when I was giving a list of the many things that I'm not responsible for. You may recall that back in 2001 and 2002, I was one of the proponents for reparations for the race riot. I spoke out for it in this pulpit. I wrote about it in an opinion piece for the Tulsa World, and I worked for it through the interfaith organization, Tulsa Metropolitan Ministries. Now, people would ask me, Marlon, you weren't even around in 1921, and you're not even from Tulsa. Why would you be advocating that those of us living in Tulsa now pay for the mistakes of people back then? And I would explain, you know, when a city employee, let's say somebody who's driving one of those street cleaning trucks, damages a car in the process, the city pays for it. The city's supposed to pay for it. It's the, there's a collective responsibility. It's called civil, civic government. It's the definition of civic government. So during the race riot, the city's police did not protect citizens of Tulsa and their property and their businesses. In fact, the sheriff, the report says, the official report says, the sheriff deputized white men to go on behalf of the state and continue the destruction. But the city and the state, they never rectified the claim. In other words, it's a de debt owed 
because actions of city employees caused destruction and loss of property. Now, the case eventually made it to the Supreme Court, I think it was 2004, 2005, and the claim was rejected under the statute of limitations. Not because there was no grounds, but because it had been too long. But is justice denied? Justice at all? And is, does, is time enough to heal all wounds? We know it's not. Just like physical wounds, if they're not addressed, if they're not dealt with, if not cleaned out, if they're not, they're just left, sometimes they fester. And to, to his credit, the current chief of police, Chuck Jordan, he just last month, just a few weeks ago, he publicly apologized on behalf of the police force the first time in the history of this city that something like that has happened. This is about addressing a wound that's been left to fester. And he said, my job as the chief of police in this city is to protect all of our citizens. My predecessor failed in that job when it came to citizens of the north side and their property and their businesses. And I apologize on behalf of the, the police force because that's not what we're supposed to do. And I committed, he committed to, to trying to do that to the best of his abilities now. And that's a source of light and a source of healing and the kind of redress that helps to repair relationships. The point is that we all inherited this history. It wasn't our fault, but we have to live with the consequences anyway. And we who live here today are responsible for how this city moves forward. We may not be able to, and we can't. No, we can't change the past, but we are creating the future. The question is, what future are we creating? You know, it's said that over 20% of our country is food insecure, and even more, 25%, I believe, of Oklahoma, Oklahomans, which is a fancy word for saying are hungry. And, we also, and I know we pay farmers not to grow food. Someone else would have... Different degrees going to have to explain how that works to me. Many Americans don't have access to affordable health care, even if the Affordable Care Act is wildly successful beyond everybody's imagination. There's going to be millions of Americans who do not have affordable health care that works. Our public schools are failing by everybody's grade. Our prisons are overflowing. There is no avoiding the fact that the rich are getting richer in this country and the poor are getting poorer and most people are just staying the same, barely. That's just the fact. Just 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 in the last week, I think the stock market broke like three record, all-time high records. Well, unemployment remains really bad with little signs of abatement. But let's think about this. We've had, in the last 20 years, in the last two decades, we've had over 13 years of a Democratic president in the White House. Both Congress and Senate have changed, on the national level, changed back and forth. Democrats have been in charge. Republicans have been in charge. Since I've been in Tulsa, the governor, we've had more years with a Democratic governor than a Republican governor but it's gone back and forth, it's pretty even. Same thing with the mayor in the city of Tulsa, exactly even in the years I've been here, Democrat and Republican. And yet, this is the situation that we're in. Is it all either party's fault? No. Is it my fault? Is it your fault? Well, Somewhat no, somewhat yes. Regardless of fault, the question is, how can I take responsibility for making things better? Because in the end, the test of a nation's character, just like the test of a person's integrity, is not determined by whether we make mistakes or whether we've made mistakes, 
but it's determined by how we respond to the mistakes we've made. 